Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Before we begin tonight's meeting, um, I'm going to read the. Uh, I'm going to read some info from our information specialist at the town. After today's power outage, our public TV channel is offline. We have contacted Cox Cable and we haven't heard back from them. Um, we are recording the meeting as normal and it will be available for playback tomorrow on YouTube and on the normally scheduled times when the TV channel is back on the air. So we are aware that there is a recording problem this evening. Um, and I do want to make that announcement. Um, now, if we may, be, we can begin. Councillor Forrest, would you lead us in the pledge? Thank you. Would the town, um, would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton here. Councillor Forrest here. Councillor Hurley is unable to attend tonight. Councillor Latina here. Councillor Lesser here. Councillor Rao here. Councillor Spinella here. Deputy Mayor uh, Martino here. And Mayor Morin Bello here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have no hearings this evening, so our first order of business will be general comments. Members of the public have five minutes to speak on any matter. Please state your name and your address for the record. Yes, sir, would you like to speak? Yes, I can. Oh, yes, come on up, sir. Thank you. I did not come to speak, but uh, I don't have to worry about the There you go. Well, we're happy to have you, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank everybody for their public service. I don't want to use up my five minutes time, but we in oh, the- Name and address oh, Joseph, first, please. Joseph Duffy, 27 Lincoln Road. Weathersfield, Connecticut, 06109. Okay, thank you, sir. I thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm not the only one who is concerned with this issue. I'm sure many. I'm sure uh, Gary here. And welcome to the town. I'm sure Gary has uh, apprised uh, some of you, or hopefully all of you, of the terrible situation existing uh, up in our area from constantly, intermittently barking dogs. I'm a dog lover. I have nothing against dogs. But I think we have now run into a quality of life issue. My neighbor was showing a house uh, at the end of our street, and the uh, future buyer was coming through and said, what in the heck is that racket? I don't know what the outcome of that uh, transaction was, but I'm telling you that there's a quality of life issue. I'm telling you that property values will eventually be at stake. And we'd like to think that in Wethersfield, we can solve things amicably and fairly, but I honestly believe after listening to this from April, uh, and I'm certainly crediting Gary for his dogged work on this, uh, from April, we are getting very, very impatient. And I'd like to hear an explanation of what has been done. I don't think the burden is on the taxpayers. We are in a government meeting here. The burden should be on the anytime Willy Wagtail up there, and it's, it's not the dogs. The dogs are doing naturally. It is the owners that at some point have to show uh, some reciprocation to the neighborhood. I invite any of you to come over any time of the day up to seven o'clock at night, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, 7.20 is this morning, 20 minutes of seven, as I, uh, 20 after six as I left now, and uh, Seeing is believing. So I respectfully request that you do something before we lose all our neighbors. And nerves are frayed. Nerves are frayed. People are sick. People have babies. Uh, it's a quality of life issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Come on up, sir. Please state your name and address. Good evening, my name is Karen Williams, 149 Garden Street in Wethersfield. Hard to follow my good friend and neighbor here, the politician and the suave devil that he is. Uh, I, I actually don't know if it's the purview of the council to be handling this issue, you certainly need to be made aware of it, or if it's planning and zoning. 
planning and zoning, very simply, has dropped the ball, has not been committed to communicating with us, has not attempted to have the empathy and understanding of what the neighbor's plight is. I'm gonna ask you one question right now. By raising your hand, tell me which of you would like to have 22, 23 dogs five houses away in your neighborhood. I don't see anybody raising their hand. We sure as hell feel that way too. Now I have written to every one of you. I have tried to update every one of you. I've had communications from Gary. First time I heard from him was the other day in over two months. We have had no response, no work. So I ask, should we be addressing you, gentlemen and ladies? Should we be talking to the planning and zoning? This is your time to speak. We don't engage in comments, but I can- I asked you a question. Right, and this is your five minutes to right. speak. We don't engage, well, so you may my make time, your comments. Tell me whom we should be addressing. We've talked with Mr. Evans and we've gotten nowhere in five, six months. Yeah, and we're for maybe going yeah. through a process right um, now. The town council is the legislative body and the town manager oversees the day-to-day -day operation of the town. So okay. the town manager would be the appropriate person to speak to about this. Would he would be, be the decision maker with the planning and zoning commission? He, you, no. Uh, go ahead, you, why don't you follow sure. up? So just, just briefly, it will go through a process. That process includes the planning and zoning commission. It's not a matter of whether or not they've dropped the ball. It hasn't been in front of them yet. Um, I had explained this in, in, in a very detailed email um, a number of occasions that there's That's a process that correct. it's going through in the pro I, I'm not gonna engage in that, but the reality okay. is the process is that will, I, it I will eventually get- I have a copy of every communication, pardon me for interrupting. You have not been communicating fairly and evenly with us. So the process is that it will go to at it will soon be in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's not there yet, but I will say that the property owner- When did this start, Mr. Evans? When did you start getting the, the complaints? So we don't listen. So we do not engage during public comment. If you'd like to speak, you have five minutes to speak, your, to have your say, and we can meet with you afterwards if you'd like, okay. or privately, but this isn't the forum okay, to great. have a back and can forth. Can we meet tonight after the meeting? I am going to be here at the end of the meeting. I'd be happy to speak with will you. Will anyone else join us who's interested in being fair to uh, the rest of us who are good neighbors, that the quality of life issue has been changed tremendously, that this has been going on for si approximately six months? April. April. And you know what? I wrote to you guys all the rules that are in your manual. And the proper procedures were not there are some major questions. The proper procedures were not filed. Neighborhood was not notified. Trying to sneak this in or slide it under uh, uh, an existing veterinary uh, application approval is just greedy, small-minded, and selfish. You want to make the town report look real good at the end of the year? Oh, we opened up 78 new businesses. Well, you lost 72 of them. They just replaced them. There's no new building and the like going on here. Nuance, nuisance laws. Again, continuous, <coughs> out of the ordinary, uncharacteristic noise is in violation of the nuisance law. Can I ask if everybody knows what the decibel limit is for Town of Wethersfield, or is that asking a question? This is your five minutes to speak. We don't engage okay. with you. Well, we need to look at that, because if you see the rules, a decibel rating has to be held at the one-foot line of the property, not out back at the railroad tracks. This owner, has taken this town for a six month ride. He has not been reciprocal, he has not been honest, he has not done, Gary, one thing that you asked him to do that you told us he was going to do. 
It's an absolute sham. And you've got good homes, families, taxpayers that were not even being considered about what our plight is. And that's grossly unfair. Do you want 22, 23 dogs out five yards from your home? Okay, your five minutes is up. You is up? To okay. Wrap up when this. can I meet with any or all of you? When can Joe and I meet with you? Tonight, tomorrow, you tell us what's convenient for you people, and we'll be thrilled to meet with you. If you're here after the meeting, I will arrange a time to meet with you tomorrow. Thank you. Gary and I can meet with you Thank tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Actually, Mayor, can I, um, can I sit in on that? I mean, or Anybody who wants to can sit in on that. We just don't want to make it a public meeting. <laughs> we don't want to have to notice a public meeting, I suppose. <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like to speak this evening? Mr. Young? Good, good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Robert Young. I'm from 20 Copper Mill Road. I pay a lot of taxes in this town, and I'm angry as hell. My taxes went up 7% this year, this July. And when I went down to pay my tax bill, I was ripped. And I'm going to continue being ripped, because next year it's going to be just as bad, if not worse, because that extra is going to always be on my bill. And that's because of you folks, every one of you. Totally irresponsible government is what we have here. And now, you're all run most of you are running for re-election. You must have heads this big to think people would vote for you. 7% I got hit with. Dave in the newspaper, he says he got hit with 5%. And I'm sure a heck of a lot more people got hit with more, higher and lower. And here we were in the year of revaluation. During revaluation, we normally have all that new assets coming on board that end up reducing our mill rate, giving us a relaxation on our tax bill for one or two years. Not this year. It was flat even. And next year, it's going to bounce from 40 point, whatever it is, 40.7. It's going to go to 44, if not 45. Shake your head yes or no, couldn't care less. It'll happen because you folks have indebted us so badly. This gentleman is talking about people not getting back to him on the town. You, Mr. Manager, I've sent you two messages asking you questions. I've never heard a word from you. So you see, you and I have something in common. These people, unless you do an FOI on them, and now I have to do an FOI because what I was asking for was something simple. Now you're going to ask, now I'm going to ask for the whole caboodle. But the fact remains, this town does not respect its citizens. It doesn't even acknowledge them. The big heads sitting here that are swollen like this keep raising our taxes. I'm a senior citizen. I want to retire. I can't retire if I live in this town because my tax bill is just too high. And I'm se almost 72. Why should I keep working and paying taxes? I should be getting some kind of benefit from the town where I don't pay my school taxes. That's what I should be getting, and so shouldn't all those other senior citizens who don't use it. Let the people who use the schools pay for it, pay to play, 100%. But we see nothing, we see no change. We, we couldn't care less up here. As a matter of fact, we don't even have transparency in this town. We should be able to go online every day and see every check that was cut in this town to see what's being spent. I've asked this for years. It never will happen. Our politicians are keeping everything close to the vest. And they don't care about the citizens to know anything. Matter of fact, matter of fact, you know, you folks that are here tonight complaining, you were lucky. You were lucky on July 17th or 16th 
2019, <coughs> Mr. Forrest, right over here, and his commission came in here and wanted to eliminate one of the speaking opportunities at the meetings. And that's exactly what him, Mr. Lesser, and Miss Latina, the, who ran the commission, did. Unfortunately for them, Mr. Spinella spoke up, and he didn't like that because people under the rules that they were proposing, you would not have been able to speak tonight. You would have to wait till next month. And that's how this town operates. We are in an election right now. I would recommend to everybody not to vote for a single person sitting up here because you're not worthy of it. You have put the screws to us citizens on a regular basis, and you have the heads this big, and you think you're going to run for another public official position where you shouldn't be. You should all resign. 7% increase in my taxes. Dave had 5%. I'm sure I wasn't the, t the highest one. I'm sure there's more people. We're going to find out what those rates are because I will find Your time out. Time is up if you'd finish. So anyway, I, I also noticed uh, that this year Tom Mazzarella is running for town council. And I really think Tom has really got it down pat. Okay, your time is up, I'm Mr. Young. I'm wrapping it up, madam. Okay, I'm wrapping it you. up. I think Tom, Tom should, uh, should be up on the council this November. And I believe Tom will bring new changes to this council. Maybe we'll have some transparency. Maybe we'll get some responses back from our administration. Because obviously, it's not happening. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Das Antonio, come on up. <laughs> Good evening, Das Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you for the town manager and the town engineer that um, met with my wife and I two or three weeks ago regarding the my problems on, on Morrison Avenue, like everybody knows. And I was pleasantly surprised that basically the town engineer agrees that there is a problem at the intersection of sight distance. That was refreshing. The only thing, I, I didn't really like the solution, his solution or the town manager's solution of uh, what they, they propose, you know, they are looking into it, uh, is like uh, to make uh, Morrison Avenue between uh, Orchard and, uh, and Tipton from 24 feet to 22 feet. In other words, move the southerly curb line from where it is now two feet into the road. Now remember, okay, I did complain about the design the way it was, and they did move the road two feet that way, and they created a problem. And it took me four or five years at least from somebody from the town to acknowledge that there is a problem there. So I guess last week they came in and they put a couple counts, you know, uh, counting the speed and probably the, the number of cars. And of course, every time I see somebody around, you know, I'm nosy. I go there and I talk and then. And uh, very, very interesting, you know, the gentleman, Dom, I guess, he had cones and he was working around now, cones on the street, and it was barely all done with the installation. The cones were still there, and a car went by. And he, and he says, let me see if it worked. It did work. Can you imagine that with the cones there, the car was going at 34 miles per hour. The posted speed is 25. Now, can you imagine if there were no cones? I think it would have been gone at 50. And yet, it's been over 10 years now. You guys are really irresponsible, not accountable, or what? How, how much longer is it going to take? Somebody was talking about the noise level. Keep in mind that the, the setback on my street is about 20 feet, 25 feet. That means from the street line to the houses. Hillcrest Avenue is 40. It's much noisier. And all for Morrison area now. Uh, a few years ago, I did complain about the hedges 
on the sidewalk on the corner or they say the the, <coughs> the southwest corner of Hillcrest and Orchard. There are bushes there. They're still the same. How long is it going to take before somebody's going to get a notice or something is going to get done there? I, I don't understand. Three, four, five years, a decade? I'm getting older, you know. I would like to see some action from the town. Now there is another house, for, you know, there is a house for sale on the corner of Tifton and Morrison Avenue. I think they just cut the grass today. But you know, on Morrison Avenue between, well, you know, on, on Morrison Avenue itself, the grass is still three or four feet tall. What's going on? Accountability. I mean, if I don't cut the grass, like, you know, for a month in my house, somebody's going to come over and is going to tell me, cut the grass. Uh, another thing, too, now, it's been a while. Silas Dean, in the, uh, in the northbound direction, the, the, the in lane, you know, the, the left lane, there are a couple dips that could be like, you know, four to six inches. Every time I go by, I have to just hug the center line so I can miss the, the, the hole on the ground. I know, I do know that it's a state highway, but the state highway is within Wethersfield. We should call and find out what's going on. Why is there is that depression? It's been already three, four, five weeks. How long is it going to take before somebody from the town sees it and cares enough to do something about it? So give the exact location of the depression on the south. It's, it's, it's basically just south of uh, 175 on the, on the, the central lo in the, the central lane in the, in the northbound direction. You'll see it. Once you're on an angle, you can see the hole. And, and you know, my question is, how long is it going to take? It's, it's just, you know, uh, I don't know. Every time I think of the the town and the way we behave, and, and, and I agree, the taxes we pay on a yearly basis, it's, it's unbelievable. I live in a house, three people, and I pay the same, the same taxes on a, on a house next door that at one point they were like, you know, nine or 10 people. I, you know, something has to change. I'm refusing to buy a new truck because uh, I don't like to pay the, the taxes. Thank you, ciao. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Mazzarella? Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. I'd like to talk about a vehicle purchase that's on the agenda for tonight. Who would have thought, right, Gary? Um, so under justification, it says purchasing vehicles in accordance with a replacement schedule and remove vehicles that are past their life cycle. Impact if not approved, the aging vehicles become increasingly expensive to maintain and are not in service due to repairs. Department head comments, the new vehicles purchased will replace aging models. Maintenance would continue to grow and vehicles would spend more time getting repaired versus being on the road. I question the validity of most of what I just read. Uh, if we go back to my one of my favorite subjects, the vehicle lift, Back in 2017, in July, we were told by the department head that the vehicle lift was not in service, that we had mechanics, five mechanics, that couldn't do the work, and if we were to spend $180,000, we would be able to bring back the majority of the work that is being sent to other outside repair agencies. At the time, Councilor Hemmen asked to see the data that supported the costs involved of sending all those vehicles out for repair. <coughs> Deputy Mayor Barry asked the same thing. How much are we spending on maintenance in the past year? I asked before the meeting and at the end of the meeting. We didn't receive an answer. The issue got tabled for about a year and a half. In January 19, it came back on the agenda. Again, Councilor Forrest asked about the costs of sending the trucks out for maintenance. We didn't get an answer. I asked 
at the beginning of the meeting. I asked at the end of the meeting. Never got an answer. The vehicle lift got approved. We spent 180,000 or so dollars. To, the lift's installed, I believe, and operational. Great. Still never got an answer. So on March 7th, I submitted an FOI request to the town, to the brand new town manager. Unfortunately, that was probably his first week working there. And didn't really have a lot of knowledge about what went on, but I tried to give him warning. And he worked on it for a while. Um, we found out that there is no system to account for the costs of the vehicle maintenance. I was given six pages of check numbers and amounts, dollar amounts, that didn't tell me anything about whether it was a truck repair, what truck, et cetera. The town manager sent me a nice letter and he said that the information I requested would require almost a forensic level of accounting to review each and every invoice and all the backup detail. I said, okay, when can we start? Then we got into the budget season and it kind of got tabled as a priority. I understand that. And Mr. O'Neill uh, was able to scan all the relevant documents, provided those to me um, in an effort to s reduce some of the workload. I confined it to the year prior to the initial submission for the lift. I finished my review. We sent two trucks out in that 12-month period, two. We spent $514 fixing a truck that had a problem with a check engine light. Probably all of you have had that happen with your cars. You have to bring it to the garage. They figure it out. They fix it. Evidently, we couldn't figure it out at our garage. So we sent it out, $514. The second vehicle we sent out was for uh, $1,200, it was for an annual inspection of one of the fire apparatus. And it was under a service contract. So we spent the total of $1,700 of outside vendor work because we didn't have a vehicle lift. So we spent $180,000 so that we could bring $1,714 worth of work back into the town. Makes no sense whatsoever. I'll finish up later. I hope you'll consider where the data is coming from and table this matter until you get all the answers of how much it actually costs to maintain a vehicle and why it's stated that it's going to exceed, uh, that we're going to be, uh, maintenance costs are going to continue to grow and we're going to spend more time with the truck off the road than on the road. I don't believe the data exists, and therefore, we shouldn't buy the truck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazzarella. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Okay, seeing no one, I will declare public comment closed. Um, and we will move into council reports. Counselors, does anyone have a report for this evening? Councilor Forrest? Thanks, Mayor. Briefly, uh, redevelopment committee uh, redevelopment committee met and is uh, basically looking at four major areas of redevelopment in town. Not necessarily for the area part, but they're looking at a blight ordinance and in, and improving the blight ordinance so that it might be have a little bit more teeth for maybe some of the areas, especially the commercial areas that uh, may not look so nice and uh, may may be forming a blight. We're looking at streamlining the review process for bigger projects. So. You know, uh, someone that's coming in here wanting to do development can have a nice streamlined process and get through our boards and commissions in an appropriate way, be it and continue to improve our business friendly atmosphere. Also looking at some various incentives for developer developers and also going out doing business visits and meeting with uh, landowners <coughs> in order to see which landowners are interested in possibly even move, either moving their property or uh, building that good personal relationship, which is important for the development of the town and having getting a comfort level about doing business in this town and increasing our development and our quality of life. And that's a quick report. There's a, that was a two hour meeting or so, but that's the quick report from the redevelopment agency. Thank you. Anybody else? Deputy Mayor? EDIC, 
<coughs> excuse me, EDIC met before redevelopment, and um, uh, we went through the list and status of all the empty buildings. Uh, the developer uh, came in and talked to us about uh, the hamburger restaurant he's going to be putting up on Maple Street and where things stood on that. Uh, and we got, like I said, we got an updated status on all the open projects in town. And then after both meetings were completed, there was a tour at Mediplex. The owner opened up the building and showed us the condition inside, and uh, it's in real bad shape. I don't think it can personally be rehabilitated. I think it's going to have to come down. I mean, the roofs are leaking, water's coming in, uh, the mold is starting, so uh, it's going to be an interesting project for whatever developer takes it over. Okay, anything else? Any other counselors? Okay, seeing none, we'll move into council comments. Are there any council members who have comments this evening? <coughs> Councilor Rell. Uh, no, I just concur with the two gentlemen who live um, over by the uh, Garden Street in Old Weathersfield. Um, I too have been, as much of you all have been on the email chains for what's um, gone on down uh, at uh, the new uh, dog boarding facility on Beaverbrook. Um, I just had a, a couple questions, and I know you know we'll have further time to discuss it, and hopefully we could get Peter Gillespie in um, if that meeting is going to occur tomorrow to be able to get some of these questions answered. One question I did have was: Was there consideration from going? from a veterinary hospital, which was there before, to a uh, doggy daycare facility? Was there any consideration of what the difference would be? Or did P&Z at the time think that it was just simply one business replacing another business? Sure. I know that's not you know, part of the uh, counselor comments, but you know, I'd like to get that cleared up tonight for at least these two gentlemen and anybody else who's listening um, prior to any meetings that might occur. If, if I, okay, um, so uh, the quick answer or the quick explanation is this. There's multiple ways to go through this type of approval. There's an administrative process as well. So, or there's an administrative pro approval process and then there's a committee or commission process. In this particular case, because the zoning ordinance um, allows for similar uses, same or similar uses, um, well, backing up, so the zoning regs allow veterinarians uh, and or veterinary clinics and um, kennels in the same category. So therefore, it doesn't have to go through a planning and zoning process. It just needs an administrative approval. Based off of the application that was put in, um, it was a like for like use. And therefore, um, the requirements and special permits go with the land, not with the business. So one business left, the other one came in, they met the same requirements um, under the zoning regs and therefore it never went to planning and zoning. Right now we're in a process as we're evaluating and working with the property owner um, to potentially, as again, going through the process to get in front of the planning and zoning commission. But we can't just jump in front of the planning and zoning commission, it has to be a referral. The referral has to come from a number of methods, but in this case through the zoning enforcement officer. Zoning enforcement officer, myself, Peter Gillespie, um, building department and the fire marshal's office have all been out on site and we've been tracking this over the last several months. Um, and so we're getting to that process at this time. Um, the, the business owner has been responsive um, and helpful, um, perhaps not moving as quickly as the, as the neighborhood would like. But, um, but again, that, it never went in front of planning and zoning. It wasn't per our own regulation and approved by the state. It didn't need to go based off of the application. Whether or not things changed along the way that would require or trigger it to go to playing in, in zoning is a question that the zoning enforcement officer is gonna determine. Right. Um, has the zoning enforcement officer determined any decibel levels or has there been meters out there? Have there been, you know, I know from some of your comments, you've been on site or um, in the neighborhoods at early morning hours, you mean? Yep, uh, so I've been out there and the police have been out there to do the measurement and in which case the decibel level based off of the abutter is cannot exceed 55 decibels and it doesn't exceed 55 decibels. Okay. So, you know, we're, right now we are working through the process as I said to try to balance 
uh, the needs of the residents with the needs of the business in the area, and we're hoping that we can find a common ground that will mm -hmm. be suitable. Now, is there any um, is there any action the um, or lack of action that the property owner cannot take? I mean, can he just simply say, "Hey, you know, I've been approved by P and Z. The town has." Uh, um, allowed for my business to be here and you know I'm not violating any ordinances I'm not violating any noise restrictions um, I have a like-for-like like business with what was there currently I mean is there a recourse that the, the town can take at that point that that business owner says you know listen guys I'm, I'm complying with everything that you presented to me when I you know applied X number of months ago or a year and a half ago yeah, they're, they're, again, it's the process, and sometimes government gets tied up in red tape, but it's there to protect both sides. So the reality is that town manager, town council, um, don't have the authority at this point because it's an approved permit, so it has to get in front of the zoning. Um, uh, well, in this case, we'll go in front of planning and zoning, which will come through the zoning enforcement officer. So um, we'll work through an action. If there's an actionable item that shows that they violated the the restrictions of their administrative approval. And if they have, that would bring it in front of planning and zoning. And that's what we're working towards okay. right now. Um, is that the goal that we're looking for? Or is the goal maybe let's say to the property owner, why don't you take steps on your own to to mitigate some of this uh, you know, noise levels, be it you know, change of hours, uh, screening, um, you know, yeah, they, and just they've had a number of um, businesses come in to actually give them quotes as to ways they could possibly absorb some of the sound or reduce the sound. Um, in most cases, they've said there's no guarantee. The businesses, vendors coming in are saying there's no guarantee. Uh, so the last conversation was we directed them and gave them a list of acoustical engineers for them to pick from. They interviewed three of them. They've picked one. I don't know the date offhand as to when they're coming out, but they're going to judge to determine whether or not... Um, it's a redirect if it's bouncing off of the, um, it's a brick uh, facade. So is it redirecting, bouncing off the facade and traveling across if there's something that they can put in place to absorb the sound. So it's kind of a dual track. Um, we're trying to be considerate of the residents, the businesses, uh, the business and the understanding that the cost for some of these potential buffers is in the tens of thousands of dollars, which makes their business plan unfeasible. So the reality is, we want to give them the opportunity, as I would to any resident, the opportunity to cure whatever the deficiency is. Doesn't mean we can't at the same time follow the administrative process on our end to make sure they reach compliance. Oh, to the, your latter point, I do hope that the town um, does follow through on that compliance part and that yep. you know we stay on top of um, you know any um, violations that may yep. be occurring or. Um, maybe even look to change some of, uh, you know, unfortunately use this as a model to change some of what we approve um, and how we approve it for um, businesses coming into the town. Yep. No, I can say that it, that is already in process. Great. Thank you. Any other council members have comments? Deputy Mayor? Uh, a couple weeks back, I want to commend our uh, public safety department, our park and rec department, uh, uh, a couple of weeks back, they had the National Night Out. They moved it from uh, Millwoods up to the community center. Uh, it was a nicer facility. A lot more stuff was there. Uh, Councilor Rowe was there, Councilor Spinella, Hurley, and myself. I don't know if you want to jump in with some comments afterwards, but uh, they had a, you know, a real nice show there. They had the uh, canine dog there fenced in, and he did some demonstrating there you know, with the dog. Uh, Starbucks was there offering free iced coffee and hot coffee to you know people who wanted it. Uh, the Nature Center had um, some of their animals caged in that the kids could go up and play with. Fire department had their smokehouse and stuff that they could the kids could go through the fire trucks and a bunch of other stuff there. So they they did a real super job this year and they should all be commended for the great job they did. Thank you. Any other comments? 
Okay, um, I have a couple comments. Um, I have a mayor's hour this Thursday from five to six if residents would like to come in and speak to me one on one. I will be available in the town manager's conference room again this Thursday from five to six. Um, I'd also like to wish all of our school students, I know they're all moaning and groaning, school starts August 29th, so wish them all a successful year. Um, and finally, uh, the town did close on Keisha Farm. Um, and again, again, my comments are that this is the last upland parcel of farmland in our community, 32 acres of land. Um, and the voters voted to purchase the farm by over 1,000 votes. Um, the town closed on it in the beginning of August. We only had about 9% open space in Weathersfield, which is um, a much lower percentage than most of our surrounding communities. So now we will begin the process um, for planning on the farm. The town manager has asked for people to submit their names if they would like to be considered for the committee. Uh, and now he has the in unenviable job of going through the um, several names that he's received to try to call that group down to nine members. Uh, so those are my comments for this evening. Um, next we have town manager's report. So that's a great segue because the first component that I was going to talk about were uh, the three committees that I made an announcement for. We were looking for volunteers. Uh, that came out in end of July, beginning of August, one for Keisha Farms to create an ad hoc committee to uh, go through a process for Keisha Farms, and another uh, to determine the use of funds for the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Uh, we've been approved for up to $100,000, but for specific, um, there's specific requirements related to it. Part of those requirements would to be form, um, it's really two committees, but it's, uh, we're calling it one to get the names together. A committee to create uh, a selection committee to determine who would serve on an advisory committee to determine how those funds could be used. Um, so that hit the paper and Facebook and the town website in end of July, beginning of August, and we received a total of 55 names of individuals who were interested as well as a mix of resumes or just statements as to why they would fit within the commission. Uh, you mentioned several names, I think 40 plus or minus were just for Keisha Farms. So there's a lot of interest um, in the committee and I'm going through a process to kind of balance off uh, uh, the committee. We're thinking somewhere between seven to nine names. Uh, once I'm able to get through those names and have conversations with individuals um, my intent is to forward those names to a council meeting to make an announcement so that it can be public. Uh, again, the intent is to make this as public a process as possible to get the information out to the residents, to allow the residents an opportunity to provide feedback, um, and then for the committee to provide a recommendation to me to provide to the council. Um, and the goal to announce those names for both committees would be, I'm going to say some at some point in September, one of the meetings in September is the target. Um, Councilor Forrest, as you mentioned, uh, members of the RDA, the town planner, uh, Peter Gillespie, as well as myself, have been working on a multifaceted approach to stimulate growth in the community. As part of that approach, we're looking at a number of things, uh, a number of ordinances within town and how they function, one of them being the blight ordinance. Um, while it's, it's uh, a well-written document, the reality is there's been a lot of change at the state level as to how much flexibility a municipal blight ordinance can have. It actually, the state about three years ago really allowed municipalities to have some teeth in enforcing their blight ordinance. And so what uh, the RDA is working through, uh, our zoning enforcement and blight enforcement officer, Charles Morrison, as, waiter, as well as Peter Gillespie and myself are uh, with the RDA working on a draft as how we can address both blight in commercial properties and blight in residential properties. Um, and I know uh, one member happened to mention uh, an issue that's going on or has been going on in their neighborhood. Um, so to date, we've had some enforcement ability. Uh, at the end of the day, the way our ordinance is written, we're very limited as to how strong our enforcement can be. So we're really looking to revise that um, to encourage compliance. And then a couple just quick notes on development. Um, I'm pleased to announce that the development at 275 Ridge Road, which is a residential development, um, has achieved 100% occupancy, which based off of just market trends, that kind of gives me feedback that we're not at a saturation point within the market, which means we have some ability to, um, to capture 
existing growth, which works out well because the second uh, component I wanted to mention is the Borden uh, is slated to have its first uh, model open available sometime early fall. We're hoping September. And that's about it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Does the town clerk have any communications? I do. Uh, there's going to be a Democratic town uh, primary on September 10th from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we have all polling places are going to be open. The absentee ballots are available from my office starting tomorrow. All of them will, and all return uh, ballots will be counted at a central location in town hall on election night. We have uh, seven candidates running, and you can vote for any six of them. And you have to be registered in the party to vote at, in the Democratic primary. Okay, thank you. And I have 1,500, mm -hmm. I have about 1,585 dogs registered. Not to vote. came on the uh, Friday <laughs> before the dog swim. Specifically for very good thank you um, okay so next is council action um, we have acceptance of a resignation I do believe we have a resignation yeah. we have a motion a motion to um, uh, for one resignation from the Weathersfield Advisory Committee for people with disabilities Joan Haynes 516 Highland Street from 7119 to 63021. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, are there any questions or comments? I just want to make a quick comment. She has given 35 years of her life in the town of Weathersfield to volunteer, and she does such a wonderful job. Her heart is truly in that committee. It's a major loss for the town, and she is to be commended. Joan does a wonderful job, so thank her very much if you bump into her in the grocery store. <laughs> Thank you, Council Latina. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have any appointments to boards and commissions, and we do not have any ordinances or resolutions for action. We have no matters of unfinished business. So that brings us to other business, budget, reconciliation, and transfers. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the fiscal year 2019 budget transfers. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Town Manager, would you like to begin the remarks? Sure, I'll do a quick intro. Thank you, Mayor. Per Section 709 of the Town of Weathersfield Charter, I hereby submit the 2018-19 end-of-year transfer recommendations to the Council. Recommendations are to make departments whole and overall reflect the strategy to reinvest unencumbered funds into town infrastructure. Town Finance Director Michael O'Neill, uh, as well as myself, we're, we are here to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Good Thank evening, you for Mike O'Neill, Director of Finance. Um, I thought perhaps I would speak from, uh, it's the fourth page in your agenda packet, and actually there was a, a slightly revised version of this report that was just hopefully distributed to you. It has we, a couple of yellow highlights on it. Yes, we did receive it at our places and you make my eyes work with this small font. I apologize. <laughs> I have a pair of the purse. We're trying to save paper. <laughs> 11 okay. by 17 is very expensive. Okay. Um, or do you have, do you want to go through this or you are, would you? I, I will try to be you. brief and mm -hmm. certainly answer any questions that you have. So the, the purpose of this exercise is to take unexpended appropriations and transfer that budget authority uh, such that the funding can be moved to non-lapsing funds. Um, so for that purpose, and also we have four departments that uh, have exceeded their budget, and so there needs to be, in conjunction with that, just a, a, a transfer from the contingency account to cover that. So let me first, um, I've, I've labeled a couple of the columns on the spreadsheet with those very small numbers that have circles around them. So column labeled one is what remains unexpended by department or overexpended. The total there is for all departments is 
$814. There are four departments that were over budget. Uh, the town attorney was over budget by 50000 and change. That's due simply to legal matters and legal costs um, in excess of the amount budgeted. That amount, that budgeted amount has remained the same for a number of years. Next department is the tax assessor over by $15,000 and change. That is due, you may recall, to uh, a firm was retained to perform personal property audits. That firm worked on a strict contingency basis, which means they were only paid to the extent that they found uh, property that could be assessed. Um, what we had to do was record the cost of those audits in the department and the revenue separately on, on the revenue side of the budget. Um, the fees were about 20000 if I recall, 20000 $22,000. Um, the revenue related with the property that was discovered was more than that. Um, so it's a, it was a net gain for the town, but again, the expense shows up in the assessor's office that was not budgeted for. Um, um, there has been a, a provision included in the fiscal 20 budget uh, for those audits as they will continue. <coughs> The uh, fire department was over by 34000 almost $35,000. That was due primarily to the hydrant fees uh, paid to the MDC. The timing of the, that bill was changed um, by the MDC. Um, it was, had been billed at the end of the year and is now being billed in the beginning of the year. So we effectively, um, in addition to a 25% increase in those fees, we paid two years worth. We only budgeted one year's worth of hydrant fees, um, but we had to pay for two years worth of those to sort of get ourselves on the billing cycle of uh, the new billing cycle for the MDC. So that's why that it was over. And then lastly, physical services was over by 102,000. That was due to um, overtime uh, related to storms and the increase during the year in the fees or Mira, which is where we take our trash. And they had, um, you may recall, some problems at that facility that caused a shutdown for a number of weeks or months, and costs related to that were passed on to the towns. Okay, do council members have questions for finance director? Deputy Mayor? Mike, just one question for you. Uh, one of the departments on here is one that we have no control over, uh, in that they, they tell us what they're charging, and that's the probate court. And I see they came in under budget. I'm just wondering why, because normally, you know, whatever they submit is what they end up taking. So how, how did we end up with almost, you know, $9,000 back this year? I know that we, the timing of when they give us their number and when we do our budget is, you know, at the same time of the year. I believe they were negotiating a lease at the time that we were preparing the 19 budget. I'm going to guess, based on that very round $34,000, that we had to just make an estimate, and that's why. So they billed us what they, you know, their actual sure. costs. We had a little extra in there um, because there was some unknown at the time. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Lester. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mike, I wanted to ask you about the radio reserve. It looks like they are one of the largest recipients, if not the largest recipient of the transfers. Can you kind of describe how that works the, in terms of the radio reserve and give us some more content around that? Sure. So let me just, so I, I said there's sort of two, two things we want to accomplish. One is covering those overages, those four departments um, that I explained, and then the <coughs> remainder of those funds. What we do is, so it's $788,000. We like to leave a little bit, $15,000 in the event that there's changes during the audit. So that leaves us with $773,000. We've put together proposed uh, transfers um, to really f four areas. The capital non-recurring expenditure fund, about $591,000. The compensated absences fund, about $81,000 CIP fund, about $84,000, and then $17,000 related to the acquisition of the, the Keisha property, um, just to cover some uh, unexpected costs related to the acquisition. So 
to, and now to answer your question within that, um, we, we are proposing a transfer of $200,000 to the radio reserve as part of the CNEF fund, uh, transfers to that fund. Um, that is a, typically what we've done in past years is taking the unexpended money from public, public safety departments and put it in there. Um, what we have used that for in recent years is to offset lease payments, the lease payment on the radio system. We're paying for that under a 10-year lease. So what has been proposed here, what, what I, uh, my office proposed was to replace the money that we used in the, nine, in the fiscal 20 budget. So in the fiscal 20 budget, we took 200,000 out of the radio reserve to help offset the lease payments. This proposes to just sort of replenish that, put it back there for the 21 budget, presumably, or, or any other needs. And how much is still owed, do we know? Let me guess in round figures, I believe it was a $3.6 million lease and we are probably a little over halfway through that. Mm -hmm. I'd have to get you. Just, uh, and do you recall what, what year? Does that go back a, a fair ways? The lease? Yeah. I, I think about five years. We're probably a little I bit past that. halfway. Yeah. That was right, up, I, I remember it was right about the time that I, I came to the town. Okay, and you think we're about halfway through? Yeah, a little over. I, I would say we're probably, you know, maybe year six if I had to guess. I, I can get the information mm -hmm. for you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mark. Okay, any other questions? Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Mike, I noticed the fund balance, 12.17. Um, what was, do you remember what it was ending fiscal year last year? So if it's up or down? I thought I remembered I, it in the 11s, but I don't want to. You're, I think you're right. That was, uh, it was under 12. Right. That's, um, that's really, it's a, it's a good, strong fund balance. And I'm wondering if there's, if we're above 12 and even like significantly above 12 at 12.17, if we're able to look at some of our bonding and our debt, you know, and our credit ratings and so on, and to be able to play up this strong financial picture with them in order to lower some of our debt service. Yeah, it is. Fund balance is one of the main things that the rating agencies look to. Uh, right, which we've and talked they, about. And they, yes, and they s never are seemingly satisfied with how much we have. They always like to see more, but the, again, it's. I think what what they do look at is the trend, and you know, they they like to see that we are maintaining that, that we're we're adhering to our policy. Is that a dialogue that you think we can open up now that we're significantly above twelve? Or, or reopen that dialogue to see if that's something that we can talk to them about as we get rated for our bonding a agency and if we should look at maybe even some type of a refinance as we move forward? Yes, yeah, we're always in communication with our financial advisor about opportunities to refinance. You know, we're, we're obviously with the closing of the, the acquisition of the Keisha property, um, you know, that was, that was approved for financing at referendum, so we're, we'll be working on that very soon. So it probably won't get solved, right, obviously, right at this dais right now, but maybe through you, Mr. Town Manager, if we could just start that dialogue to see if these the numbers that we're seeing right now as we close our books for the previous fiscal year might be able to give us some leverage as we move forward with the next couple fiscal years as it relates to indebtedness. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Just one comment. Okay. Do we have the numbers, Mike, from last year, what we, um, what our fund balance was, or not fund balance, but um, the overages for last year? <laughs> I have them up here, in ra again, in round figures. Um, actually, I wrote them down a little earlier because <laughs> I knew you would ask. Yeah, somebody's gonna <laughs> ask that question. <laughs> um, we had, so for the fiscal 18 budget, there yep. was $2 million unexpended. 800 of that had been, if you recall, in, so in, it was uh, with the whole uh, state budget yep. sort of delays and all of that, we and the allocated. cuts to ECS, you in February of 18 uh, approved what we were calling a deficit mitigation plan where we all agreed we were gonna be short on revenues, the board agreed to keep their spending downtown as well. 
that was 800,000. So start with 2 million unexpended, subtract that $800,000 that we planned because we were short on the revenue side. So we worked at this time last year, we were working with about a million to a million two. Okay. My only comment would be, you know, while I like the, the idea of going to the body agencies with the 12%, you know, um, budget reserve, we're also looking at 1.2 million last year, close to 800,000 this year. So overage for the last two years of about $2 million. Um, you know, it would be good to go to the bond agencies and say how good we're doing, but I would also like to go back to the taxpayers and say, you know, we budgeted for two more million dollars than what we actually spent. And what we're doing is we're giving it and we're putting it back. While I do like to see some of the reserves, you know, as you know, Councilman Lesser was saying for um, the radio reserve to pay down some of that debt, um, I do like the idea of paying off um, the vehicles up front rather than leasing. Um, I will probably have comments on those two trucks later on. Um, but a lot of this is going into reserves that maybe we should allocate some additional funding so that costs going forward, uh, even more so than what we are doing right now, will help offset some of the additional burdens on taxpayers going forward. I mean, I'm preaching to you, but uh, you know, I'm talking to the whole council as well. Thanks, Mike. Understood. Sure. You're welcome. Deputy Mayor, did you have a comment? I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, part <coughs> of that, Mike, that overage that we have this year is due to the fact if you check out the revenues side of the house, uh, we had a very good year in building permits. We budgeted 375, which is about the normal, and we brought in, was it like 670 or something like that, Mike? You know, part of it was due to the board and other stuff, but you can't project some of that stuff until like, you know, start to dig in the ground before you can add it in. You can't project something's going to happen because it's going to be delayed. So there's, you know, almost $400,000 in revenue that came in that we weren't expecting or projecting that makes up part of that uh, overage. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I just ask that the town clerk please um, make sure that the final budget transfer table is in our minutes because we didn't read all of the uh, numbers into the record with the motion. So if you could just make sure that does appear in the minutes. Just one more comment. The change that I made to this today simply reflects the library's recommendation. The library board met on Thursday night. This was prepared Thursday afternoon, so or Wednesday afternoon rather. Um, very minor, about a sixty-six hundred dollar change, but it just it simply reflects uh, what the library board recommended for the tr transfers related to the the, the, sur the surplus in the in the library line. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Dolores, did you get that vote? Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have a bid purchase of physical services and fire marshal pickup truck as approved in the fiscal year 1920 budget. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to purchase two trucks in accordance with the replacement schedule and need and remove said vehicles that are past a reasonable life cycle. And do we have a second? Second. Okay. Town manager? Thank you, Mayor. The purchase of these vehicles was approved as part of the 2019-20 budget process uh, under the category as uh, leased vehicles. Due to the availability of unencumbered funds associated with the year-end transfers, I'm recommending that we pay these vehicles up front versus financing them over a period of time. Physical Services Director Sally Katz, as well as uh, myself, are here to answer any questions that you may have about the purchase. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any initial comments before we go into questions? Uh, yes, I would, actually. There are, there are a few things I'd like to, sure. to make comment on. Um, specifically on the truck that would um, be used in physical services. The truck that we are um, wanting to replace the new vehicle with is currently 12 years old. Um, when I came to the town, we were to be on a replacement schedule of every 10 years with our vehicles. 
This vehicle is two years past its replacement um, schedule, so it is currently 12 years old. This truck is in service five days of the week, uh, every day of, of the year that we work. Primarily from April through November, it is used uh, to haul a trailer, which carries a riding mower, standing mower, and other equipment that is used um, for landscaping and mowing purposes. In the winter, it is used for snow plowing. Um, it is used at the schools and on the smaller cul-de-sacs. Um, during the winter, it is equipped with a plow, obviously because it does plowing. The two, this truck, which is a 2007, has um, approximately currently 41,000 miles on it. They are all city miles. It's not highway miles. These are all stop and start types of miles. The truck has approximately uh, 12,500 hours. Um, that would be straight hours, but we also know that there are weeks where this truck has been in service almost constantly as we have battled storms. So I would approximate that there would be, during the snow months, an approximate another 5,000 hours uh, in total. So there's somewhere in the range of 17,000 hours on the road for this vehicle. Um, during the non-snow months, as I, as I said, the truck is equipped with a trailer that brings equipment that's used on alternate weeks. On week one, it is used um, throughout that week to uh, bring equipment to 55 different areas throughout town, everything from uh, islands, the green um, parks, open spaces. On the second week, uh, that truck brings equipment and we use it for landscaping, um, things to do at uh, 22 town buildings. And then it rotates again back to the week where it, it has the 55 areas where it mows. So it's stopping and starting, stopping and starting um, on, those, on that rotation. Um, unfortunately, due to its use during the snow, it also has um, experienced a significant amount of corrosive salt to it. The truck, even though it is washed um, after every, plow every plowing experience, it has holes that have rotted through the driver's and passenger sides of the floor. Corrosion has worn the drive shaft um, we, the, there is one of the differentials has, um, has been corrosive and it ha has a leak which cannot be uh, fixed. The differential would have to be replaced. And um, there is corrosion through the heat shield. I do have photos if anyone would like to see. Um, Uh, the question was, th this truck is a four-wheel drive truck that we are requesting, and we went to the state bid process to get the lowest possible price on this vehicle. Okay, are there any council questions or comments? Deputy Mayor? I have one. It's not on that particular truck. It's on the uh, fire marshal's vehicle. Okay. Uh, when you came to us during the budget process for this, it was my understanding that uh, when his truck was replaced because he needed something to carry mm -hmm. more stuff in, his current vehicle was going to be assigned to the custodial supervisor. And now if I read this letter from, uh, that it's looking to have it go to replace a fire department uh, excursion. And I'm just wondering why the change? Yeah, so if I may, Deputy Mayor, uh, that was Anthony Dignati, who's the fire marshal at the time when he originally in February uh, produced his budget request. Uh, that was the intent. And then by the time we got to actually budget negotiations and a conversation with Sally about need uh, within, Custodial total manager. need within the department and within the organization, it was determined that greatest and best use was actually to recycle it um, to the, um, I can't remember the, the title. Custodial the custodial manager. Manager. supervisor. So, so we'll yes. be going there instead. Yep. Like yes. yep. Okay, yep. I just wanted to make sure my notes were right from when we went through the budget yep. process. Yes, and, as, and as his job, the custodial manager's job, um, just to remind people, literally is to go from school to school to school every day. And so a vehicle, a town vehicle, is, is important to him and to do the work that he does in addition to bringing equipment from school to school um, to utilize it to our best extent. I just wanted to make sure because mm -hmm. I know that's what helped me accept <laughs> purchasing it. Understood. And I just want to make sure that was going to happen. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other council comments? Yeah. Councilor Lester? No, no, I'm pointing to Matt oh. was raising his hand. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Well, Councilor no, Forrest? No, no, I was pointing to Amy that you were. <laughs> that I would raise my hand? <laughs> Thanks. Um, Sally, um, I feel like there's uh, this always this balance, right? And mm -hmm. between clearly the use case for this truck is a, is a heavy one plowing, salt, the whole bit. Um, but then, of course, the maybe the way the motion happens to be phrased, which is this wording, is in terms of useful life and versus, um, which is more of almost like an accounting term rather right. than an a on-the-ground mm -hmm. uh, an on the ground term, right? It's not, it's, it, this truck is not working. This truck is in the shop. This truck is unmanageable anymore for the regular day-to-day -day operations of the town of Wethersfield. That's sort of more of that needs-based decision that I think at least I'm not struggling with, but have to consider and maybe mm -hmm. make a purchase decision like we all would. Mm -hmm. Is the car in that better shape? I see some of the stuff here that's pointing out, some of the rust and some of the areas, and although I'm not to be a mechanic of any kind. I do change my own brakes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So some of that is, you know, obviously rust on a rotor, like you can fix a rotor, right? And there's that plate that's behind the rotor, I forgot what the name of it is. It's sort of like a replaceable part. Others, floors, for example, are a little bit more heavy duty. So I'm trying to get a feel for, we understand the use case is, is, is strong on this particular vehicle, but what's the needs case for this vehicle? Can you help me wrap my mind around that and not useful life, but is it been out of commission a lot? You know, that, that's usually the sort of unreliability of the particular versus there's some rust on it. Of course there's some rust on it. There's some rust on my car. There's, to kind of help you out, there's more than just rust on it, and it has been out of commission. The heat shield yeah. damage, the differential damage, the damage to the, to the brake system, not just the rotors. Um, and I agree sometimes with the language is, is not a one-for-one -one swap on it. Sure. Um, the vehicle hasn't been in it hasn't been in commission, especially because it's it, to um, work through those problems. It was unreliable, and so we have not been using it very much, um, if at all, really, um, because we do have a significant um, issue with multiple safety features of that vehicle, including the heat shield including the brakes, uh, the braking system. Um, and so knowing that that vehicle is, um, has a significant amount of hours on it, a significant amount of, again, town miles on it, um, it is one which it's just how much money do you, how much money and time do you continue to put into a vehicle and not get the return from it. And so we have been using it. I'm not saying that it's, you know, been mothballed, yeah. um, but it is unreliable. There are significant issues with it. And I'm sure that when you drive your car, if you find something that isn't working properly, you know, you, you try to fix it immediately so that it makes the ride reliable. Um, I'm not saying the ride itself, but the, the use of the vehicle. So what is our, you're the expert in physical services and understanding these life cycles mm -hmm. and use, usability. So how do you make that balance between, hey, I think that this truck is gonna have to go in or needs $4,000 of repairs or some number versus the purchase? What is There must be some sort of general principles that you use as far as the guidelines. There's, lot, there's lots of things that go into making this type of request. Number one is you do look at a replacement schedule where you start to have a lot of repairs. And then we take a look at what the cost of these vehicles are. What's the cost of it being off the road in time, in um, activities that are not going to happen? What are the cost time, what are the cost of replacement parts? Vehicles that are more than five years old our times are very difficult to get parts for. Yes, we can get them, but they're not readily available many times in Connecticut. We're buying them from dealers, you know, in Texas or in California. We can get them, but we are then costing us for shipping and time. Um, 
And we also take mm -hmm. a look at how often are we using these vehicles and what activities are happening when we use these vehicles. We don't have a surplus <coughs> of vehicles. We have vehicles that are always being used. It's not as if I can say, okay, well, this one is not being used, so I still need to mow these 55 places. I'll just grab the keys to another vehicle and we'll go and do our work. We don't have that opportunity. So there's no downtime for the vehicles in the fleet. And in order to do the work that needs to get done, landscaping, plowing, I've got to get my people to where the work is. And so that's one of the factors that goes into, you know, the, um, the request for a purchase and also to make sure that we do keep a more modern fleet because the trucks now are more durable than in previous years. They are, um, I, I, I'll go back, I'll use my word of durable. <laughs> um, so the anticipation that this truck, that the useful life of the previous one was 10 years, you said, is this mm -hmm. truck 12 in terms of durability? Again, we will continue to do it. Um, we would, you know, you can, you can, you can, there are many factors that go into a, a useful life, as we just said. So our hope would be that it would be 12 years, maybe longer, because of the way that the cars are being built more. Now there's more, um, they're more solid in a, in a lot of ways and less moving parts, we'll say, um, to it. And so that is certainly the hope. It's what we go for. It's why we have our own mechanics maintaining these vehicles. We maintain, you know, there are certain vehicles that, that we can, that do last. This one, again, was purchased in 2007, and it is certainly our hope. Um, I think also, as we um, do better when it comes to salt and the amount of salt that we use, um, and the, the types of snow treatments that are out there that are less corrosive, that we would also hopefully get more time out of our vehicles with, without them having been uh, unsalted roads. So in my understanding, taking all these factors into consideration, <coughs> it would be your anticipation to have to keep this vehicle, but the reliability would not be good and it would be off for a certain amount of time I wish I had a crystal ball, but yes. But I mean, based on based on what I've seen right. so far, and had seen its unreliability, it's like anyone who's driving, an a, a, an old car that is kind of a clunker. You're just never sure. Yeah, it's possible that you're going to get to where you need to go every single day, but it's also possible that you don't get out of your driveway. But you're anticipating that there's going to be an issue with this car. I'm absolutely anticipating that there's going to be an issue, that there's issues with it now. So if we keep this truck in service, I am looking at completely changing out the braking system, a differential, and whatever else um, the diagnosticians tell me is wrong with the vehicle. Thank you for your time and your expertise. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Real quick, um, Sally. Can you remind us, do we recover any costs when we replace the vehicles, the vehicle that we're no longer, can we sell the vehicle, do we? Do we recover some costs from parts? Is there some? Um, we take them to auction. Okay. And then whatever gets sold at auction goes back into the general fund. So this vehicle, if we vote to replace it, will go to auction and yes, some of the money will come back to the town? Yes, it will. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Rell. I just do, I have a couple of follow-ups just from the conversations that I've heard. Um, this vehicle or this truck's coming from a, um, a state contracting bid, lowest bid? Uh, there are multiple dealers on the state bid, yes. So Councilman Forrest had asked about, you know, uh, you know, what are we getting out of this truck compared to what we got out of the 2007 truck? You know, why did that only last? 12 years and 41,000 miles, you know, we may not be, are we paying for top-notch undercoating on it? I mean, do, do, because it's the lowest bid 
on a state contract uh, or a state vendor's bid, um, are we getting, you know, like yeah. for like? Are we getting, are we going to get, you know, bottom of the barrel stuff like we possibly had gotten in 2007? Or are we going to get something that's got, you know, anti-corrosive uh, undercarriage spray, mm -hmm. uh, sealed UV joints or, you know, differentials? Um, are we, uh, what are we getting now that we might not have received when we purchased the 2007? The trucks that are, we are not buying kind of the, um, the cheapest model or the most, I don't know, how am I, how do I say this? Um, just because it's on a state bid doesn't mean that we're taking someone's sloppy seconds. These are four trucks. They are first quality. They are new. And they are um, <coughs> as if you would be able to purchase them retail. We are just fortunate enough that the dealers competitively bid with the state. And so we get the advantage of that bidding and pricing package. Gotcha. Okay. Um, one of the things that we um, will always fight, whether it's 2007 or 2019, is the corrosive nature of the salt that we use on our roads. But in order for us to be able to do de-icing and snow and streets, we use salt. And we even have a wash bay where every vehicle is washed sometimes two times during an active storm in order to get the corrosive salt off of it. Um, but it doesn't make it go away 100%. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing. It is, it is the salt that does a lot of the corrosion. The other thing is this vehicle <coughs> is used, it's not only on the roads. We're taking it on fields. We're taking it, you know, onto the green. You're in uneven structures. You're in rutted. You're in mm -hmm. the meadows. You're in places where it's not just in the streets. And yes, it also is in the streets, and I understand there are potholes <laughs> in the streets at times. Um, and so, again, you know, it's the wear and tear on a vehicle. And I would express that 12 years out of a vehicle is not a short amount of time, um, the, way that, the way that these vehicles are used, which is probably uh, more often than other people's, you know, vehicles. And because of the fact that we use our vehicles 12 months out of the year, whereas other towns or uh, other facilities are able to switch off trucks based on the activities during the year. <coughs> okay. And the town manager is going to speak on the fire um, marshal's vehicle. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just quickly, um, because fire marshal did not he couldn't make it this evening, um, as was mentioned during the budget process. His request has a lot to do with both safety and functionality of the vehicle uh, as the fire marshal and also a responder to uh, fire uh, calls for fire service. He is constantly in and out. He's wearing his uh, turnout gear. He's inspecting. So a lot of times with fires, he's bringing in all of the chemicals that he's wearing a respirator to avoid inhaling. He's, he's taking a jacket and putting in an, an enclosed SUV um, where he's basically driving for X period of time. So any material that he's bringing in with him, he continues to breathe and it continues to uh, recycle within the cabin. The other functionality component is he's currently carrying um, testing equipment, inspection equipment, fire gear that does not fit or transport easily in and out of the vehicle, which means it either gets damaged um, or the vehicle gets damaged. So this is an opportunity to not only um, right size the vehicle, but also reduce potential exposure to safety hazards. Um, and it provides, uh, it's a shuffled vehicle. In other words, it's going to move down the line. So mm -hmm. um, in terms of usability or recyclability, it's a, it's a good opportunity. I think the vehicle that's being used right now by the custodial uh, supervisor has a solar uh, attachment to keep the battery charged because no matter what they do in terms of the alternator or the battery, it will not retain a charge. It has okay. sparking issues. It's it was a, it was a hand me down from the police department um, when we tried to get the 
custodial manager some type of a vehicle in part because, um, just quickly, the custodial manager, because he's on the road so often, we really prefer that he is um, performing town business utilizing a town vehicle for insurance and other purposes. And so the vehicle that was available was one through the police department. However, that vehicle, again, should really should be sold at auction. Um, we've had numerous problems with it where um, I've gone and rescued the custodial manager at many a school um, just because it, it dies. And so that vehicle will be going to auction? Yes. Okay. I have a question. Okay. The, the way the bids are listed, the, the costs are separate. Are we voting once or each separately? Uh, I believe the motion was to purchase both vehicles. So I have to support both even though both are listed? That's right. This is a purchase for both vehicles. Okay. Any other council comments or questions? Okay, um, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. No. Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Our next um, item, we have no ordinances, resolutions, or appointments for introduction. So we will move to the minutes of the July 15th regular meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve minutes of July 15th, 2019 regular meeting. Do I, okay, motion and a second. Are there any changes, corrections to these minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. That brings us back to public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak on any matter. Please state your name and address for the record. Is there anybody who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Colantonio. Good evening again. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I, I, I guess it's sad upsetting and everything else when when we are told all kinds of things personally i have to admire that the people that uh, voted uh, yeah i have to admire the people that voted against that not because uh, we don't need trucks or not because we don't really care about weathersfield but i think sometimes we've got to question it says okay. where all this money goes you know tonight i guess you know we the budget was a little bit under. There is some money left over. Instead of putting it in next year or whatever it is, no, let's find a way to spend it. Fine. Is there any accountability in government? Personally, I don't think so. Only few do care. I heard about the, the truck tonight, and it's washed sometimes twice. I have a truck. 1999 and the only time I wash it it's when it rains <laughs> and and to my knowledge I believe that I, I drive in Wethersfield the same roads that they are salted is it a little bit you know uh, rusted yeah it is my wife is always after me says buy a new truck she says no it's still working it's it's working I mean you know every time I love to see uh, the town cutting uh, trees because you know they cut it nice, you know, in the trunk, 16 inches, and I go with my old truck and pick up the wood, go home and exercise a little bit instead of going to the golf course, you know, I exercise in my backyard. <laughs> I'm just saying that when when we try to do something right here and it doesn't really come from our pockets, I think we overspend no matter what. 41,000 miles, I got 160,000 miles on my truck. The town truck gets washed sometimes twice a day when there is a storm. <laughs> Mine gets washed only when it rains. And I'm, I know, I, I'm not out here to impress anybody. I drive my truck around and it meets my standards. Now, I don't even know how much this truck cost. But basically, you know, 10, 12 years lifetime, and 100,000 or more, it's a lot of money. I think with that money, you can fix it whenever you need to. Uh, going back to Morrison Avenue, 
Uh, and I just have to repeat this myself, that basically for the new town manager, that uh, even though I've been saying this for 10 years, he might not know, although I, I mentioned to him during the meeting that uh, before 1955, Morrison Avenue did not connect to Silas Dean. Morrison Avenue, when they built it, was completely different than any other streets, and now it's worse than Hillcrest Avenue. Now we have twice as many cars at Hillcrest Avenue, and I wonder why. No, I do not wonder why, I know why. And all those trucks from Lamour, every day, every day, three or four times, the flatbeds, whatever they call it, they are very noisy, and the decibel, it's high. I watch TV on the, in the living room. It's, it's in the front of the house. When those trucks go by, forget it. It's, it's ridiculous, and yet, it's been over 10 years. And let me say it again for the town manager. <laughs> uh, the intersection of Hillcrest and Orchard has three stop signs. It meets all the intersectional side distance. Hillcrest Avenue has only one, one intersection there. Morrison Avenue, we have two. And again, it used to meet some standards. Now it does not, based on the design that the previous administration, the, the previous town engineer and the previous town manager did it under their watch. Now, a lot of times when we talk about it, it says, well, that was done before. It doesn't really matter when it was done. There is something wrong with the street and something needs to be done because it doesn't really matter if you're gonna realign the, the street, the curb line, you're gonna move it, okay? I'm gonna be here until things are gonna be fair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anyone else was, uh, wishing to speak tonight? Mr. Young? Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. With the closing of the Keisha Farm, I've been waiting a long time for the appraisal, Mayor. Will I be getting that tomorrow morning in my email? And will you be posting it on your website so everybody can see it? You do know that 50, hold on. You do know that 5,284 people voted against the purchase of the Keisha farm. Those, a lot of those people are waiting to see that appraisal. A lot of those people are mad. A lot of those people, hopefully, won't vote for any of you people. You're not worthy of a vote. Not one. I don't care how big your head is, how blown up your head is. No vote for any of you. You're not worth it. You have screwed the citizens of this town, left and right. You took our rights away when you refused to put out that appraisal before the referendum back, on, back in November. We had no idea how good, bad the price was. We had no appraisal to work with. I've been sending you properties for a, quite a while that show that property's not selling well, property price is poor. You go to Glastonbury, they're 15, 20, $25,000 an acre. I just sent you one last night. I'm sure you all got that on the Idle Hour Farm down in Middletown. I'll and I'm sure you all went and looked at it. I hope you did. That was one beautiful piece of property with big barns, horse stalls. It was, a, it was like a, a millionaire's mansion for horses. Sold for $1,395,000. That's 25 acres. That was when you figure per acre with those gorgeous buildings and the layout, they were paying, the, whoever bought it, paid $55,000 an acre. You folks have gone on contract and lied to us and did not provide an appraisal to us. 
Matter of fact, you didn't even give us what the costs were going to be going out. And you snookered the citizens left and right. 5,200 of them didn't trust you. And I hope those 5,200 people come out and vote this year for Tom Mazzarella, who supported the need for a, an appraisal for this property. And he opposed the purchase of it just like those other 5,284 people. I'm sure out of the 600, 6,655 who did vote for it, they're gonna probably realize in a short while how snookered they were. And I hope they come out and vote for Tom Mazzarella for town council. Did we all see him tonight up here talk about that dump truck or that uh, truck for the uh, fire marshal? Didn't he do a great job? Isn't that what the truck was all about? He talked about the lift, he talked about the truck, and not to buy it. And you folks went right ahead, you're gonna buy it or, or get it. We don't need that. We don't need it. I hope those 5,284 people come out and vote for one person in this election. I also hope the 6,651 other people who voted for the Keisha Farm realize they've been snookered. They've been snookered badly, and they're now going to be paying for the next, what, 20, year, 20 years on, 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 on the bond? And all the improvements, all the insurance, all, all the interest? I know you snicker, Mr. Lesser. You're part of all of that. You held back that information. And then, of course, you're all running for, a number of you are running for election. And what's the mayor talk about? Oh, she got fracking through. Fracking. Who cares about fracking? It's not done in this state. But, oh, that's a big accomplishment. You also got LED lights. Just go back and look at the schedule for the payments for LED lights or street lights. We're paying $317,000 a year for the next six, seven years. And that's because of every one of these people. They all voted for it. Wrap it up, sir. Time and time, time again, up. they voted for these things. There's fire engines, there's dump trucks, all kinds of things are on time payments that are not gonna go away. And that's what's gonna make our town so expensive going out. We lost, we lost on that mill rate issue this year with uh, revaluation, we lost bad time, and now we're behind the eight ball, huge time. I'll hey, be your back, time Mayor. Is up. you know Thank I will. You. Is there anybody you, else who'd like we to got, speak we got, this We evening? gotta have one vote, and, uh, and that idle hour farm was a nice farm. Okay, Mr. Mazzarella, you'd like to speak? Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. Bob's not my campaign manager, but <laughs> I'm going to take the sure. I'm going to take the one vote. So um, I was pretty disappointed in the responses that you heard on the truck maintenance. I think uh, I'm going to go back and look at the video, but the way I heard it. We heard at one point that the truck was the, the physical services truck, not the fire marshal's truck. We heard that it was used every day, constantly. Then we also heard, or at least I heard, that it hasn't been being used very much because they're not sure if it's going to make it back to the, to the garage. So what is it? One or the other. Um, I don't think everybody needs to be an expert in each and every facet of physical services operation, but if you don't know something, you go out and you get some help and you, get, you ask questions and, and you compile that all and then make a sound decision on that. Uh, we heard about the drive shaft being corroded. So go out, buy a new drive shaft. You're talking about $100 or $200. We heard about we can't buy the parts locally. 
this is a worldwide economy that we're in. You, you use this company called FedEx or UPS. I, I was in the aircraft industry. We would buy parts all over the world and have them in our possession in a day or two days because a multi-million dollar aircraft was sitting on the ground, not making any money. You can buy brake components, differentials, drive shafts, and have them in all weathers field the next day. And if you need some help doing that, I'd be glad to show people how that works, okay? To sit here and listen to some of the nonsense that you heard tonight, it's, it's insulting. And I don't think it's right that we have a department head that's controlling one of the largest budgets in the town budget. I believe it's the schools, Board of Ed, and then fiscal services. Police are in there somewhere, but I mean, come on. And then to top it off, the fire marshal's vehicle has a legitimate reason for replacement that the town manager spoke about, the health of one of our town employees. He's got carcinogenic debris on his fire gear, and he's putting it in his back seat, and breathing it all on the way back to his home or to his office. Okay, that's, that's a separate issue from a dump truck or a pickup truck or whatever we're talking about. I'm talking about something that's 10 years old and it's expired, it's exceeded its useful life. That is absolute nonsense. Nonsense. Go down to Anderson Farms. Guy's been in business for a hundred, couple hundred years, right? They have trucks that are in the 1930s and they use them every day. They're on the road, they're registered, the mechanics maintain them. I mean, he doesn't go out and buy a brand new truck every year or every 10 years, you know, the costs are just not being represented properly. And I didn't hear anything about how much money the town has spent on that, maintaining that dump truck, that pickup truck. I didn't hear any facts that said it's been off the road X amount of days. I heard none of that. Okay, enough said, blood pressure's going up. I wanted to clear up one item about the Keisha Farms, that comment that Mr. Young made. <clears throat> it focuses on the word transparency, okay? Some people in town wanted to see the appraisals that were done on the farm. FOI says you don't have to release an appraisal during an ongoing transaction. They don't say you can't release it. They say you don't have to. And the, I believe the public was misled when someone or some department decided to release an inaccurate appraisal of $2.4 million when the real appraisal that the town paid for with taxpayer money was for a million dollars less. And I think those 6,500 people that voted for that farm might have a different opinion, at least some of them, I'll wrap it up, some of them might have a different opinion on whether to buy that property when they found out that we were paying a million dollars more than it was appraised for. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Anybody else who'd like to speak? Okay, seeing no one, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you and have a good night.